Great apes were one of the staples of the Tenkaichi games. They're kind of clunky to play with, sure, but they were a welcome inclusion. Not sure if they're going to make an appearance in Tenkaichi 4. I'm really hoping they will, but nothing is confirmed yet. Fingers crossed, I guess. I like how the devs went all out when it came to great apes. Every single Saiyan received their very own great ape version, and I do mean every single one. Even someone as random as Fasha. Speaking of which, she's the only giant type character who has a cinematic super rush attack. <laughs> They avoid giving rush attacks to giants, except maybe the peel of gang machine. Although, those guys aren't really all that giant. It makes you wonder why Fasha got special treatment. Maybe the devs were just big fans of her. Well, to be fair, she might be the only one with a rush attack. But she isn't the only one with special treatment. Raditz and King Vegeta have the most unique versions of Great Ape. King Vegeta's royal goatee was left unscathed by the transformation. As of Raditz, I... I think he has a mullet now. As I was doing some editing, I found something, in my opinion, incredible. They gave Nappa... And get this, a receding hairline. If we enter tournament mode with Piccolo, we will get a cute little easter egg. Instead of displaying his name as Piccolo, the game will show Majunior. Majunior was his alias during the world tournament. Same happens if we enter a tournament with Supreme Kai. Instead of displaying Supreme Kai, his name will be shown as Shin, with Shin being the name he used during his fight with Piccolo at the world tournament. Majunior versus Shin! Imperfect Cell is able to drain people's life force. By doing so, he depletes his opponent's health and adds to his own. However, if Cell attempts to drain the energy of an artificial being, i.e. an android for example, he won't be able to absorb anything. Not even his ultimate life force drain attack is able to drain their energy. I mean, they're androids. They don't possess life energy. No wonder Cell isn't able to drain them. This one is kind of puzzling. Goku Mid, aka Frieza, and the early Cell Saga version of Goku has Meteor Combination as one of his super attacks. This combo was originally used against Piccolo during the Piccolo Jr. Saga. After that fight, Goku was never seen using it again. Which begs the question, why does Frieza slash early Saga Goku have it in his moveset? I could understand if they gave it to Goku early, aka Saiyan Saga Goku. But giving it to Frieza and Cell Saga version of Goku is a tad puzzling, and I'm not complaining. I really like the move. I just find it a bit odd is all. Speaking of Frieza and the early Cell Saga version of of Goku, have you ever noticed how fluffy Goku's Super Saiyan hair looked during that specific period? Let's do a little test here. I'm going to put both Goku mid and Goku end side by side for a little comparison. Now, I'll have them both go Super Saiyan. Let's try spotting the difference now. This is something you don't really see in many Dragon Ball games. They purposely made Goku mid Super Saiyan hair fluffier and less rigid than his late Cell and Buu Saga counterpart. A genius reference to how his hair looked in the show during those respective periods. But here comes the best part. If you select Goku N's third outfit, Goku's Super Saiyan hair will still be fluffy and soft. Now you're probably asking yourselves, why does the Buu Saga version of Goku have fluffy hair? We know how sharp and rigid his hair hair is supposed to look during this period. Why does this particular outfit still feature soft hair? Well, this Saiyan armor outfit was from the Cell Saga. More specifically, during Goku and Gohan's training in the time chamber. And during that period, Goku's hair was still in its soft and fluffy shape. That's why his third costume has a different Super Saiyan hairstyle than outfits 1 and 2. For some strange reason, GT Goku will shout Taioken when performing Solar Flare. Yeah, okay. Keep in mind that he's the only character to use the original Japanese name for Solar Flare, while everyone else just says, God, Solar Flare! God, Solar Flare! If you win a match with Zangya, she will say, Don't you wish your girlfriend was tough like me? Don't ya? An obvious reference to the Pussycat Dolls song, Don't Ya? A completely random reference. But hey, I guess the people at Funimation were just having fun with it. Speaking of Zangya, there are quite a few interesting interactions between her, Android 18, and Krillin. Whoa! What a babe! 
game. <laughs> what are you staring at? If you beat Zangyo with Android 18, 18 will say something not so family friendly. Your man's kind of cute. Skank. By the way, this was only in Tenkaichi 2. I guess calling her the S word was a bit too much, considering they changed it in Tenkaichi 3. Enough talk. Let's see what you've got. Skank. Tenkaichi devs love to sneak Easter eggs on their battle stages. The Z sword can be seen firmly placed in one of the rock formations on Supreme Kai's planet. Elder Gurus is also tucked away far off in the distance. You can barely see it during regular gameplay. Lucky for us, Free Cam is here to save the day. You'd be forgiven for thinking this was just a random cave, but it's actually the cave Krillin, Gohan, and Bulma used as shelter while they were on Namek. Also, the village where Vegeta committed. Not a single character reacts to Mr. Satan's attacks, not even Cyberman. The only character that reacts to Mr. Satan's punches and kicks is the champ himself. <laughs> For some reason, you charge your key slower while underwater. I don't know if this was ever referenced in the show, but the game seems to imply that being underwater messes with key control. Tenkaichi 3 is one of the very few games to feature Goku using a Destructo disc. The thing is, it's not really easy to notice. With Krillin, all you have to do is hold the triangle button, while with Goku, you have to jump and then hold triangle. Most likely a reference to this scene during his fight with Super Buu. As soon as Goku transforms, he loses the ability to use the Destructo disc. Probably because he was only shown using it in base and not with any of the Super Saiyan forms. Hey, it's me, Goku! It looks like only a small number of you guys that watch Kadazi's videos are actually subscribed. So please, hit that subscribe button if you enjoy the content. It'll help out a lot! Do it now, or else... As we already know, the Tenkaichi series has the fusion mechanic. You select two relevant characters, for example, base Goku and Vegeta, and depending on your button inputs, you'll either perform the fusion dance or use the Potara earrings. Unlike the Budokai series, where you're able to see a visible timer signifying how much time you got left, the Tenkaichi series has no timers. You'd assume this means that you can stay in this fused state forever. Right? I did some testing. I selected Goten and Trunks and performed the fusion dance. Fusion! Ha! Ta -da! I was really curious to see if they would actually defuse. So, I stepped back and let the game do its thing for 5 hours. It's obvious that the fusion time limit mechanic doesn't exist in Tenkaichi 3. However, it does exist in a different Tenkaichi game, and it's not the one you're thinking of. Meet Dragon Ball Z Tenkaichi Tag Team. Tenkaichi Tag Team is essentially the PSP version of the Tenkaichi series with a really fun tag team mechanic. The game is almost identical to Tenkaichi 3. The graphics, presentation, movement, combat, everything. Since it's basically Tenkaichi 3 on a portable device, I assume all of the mechanics would be pretty much the same. Apparently not. We'll do the same test. Fuse Goten and Trunks into Gotenks and let them stand still. Only this time, we'll be staying still for 5 minutes. What happened? Yup, they defuse. The same thing happens with Gogeta. Vegito, on the other hand, won't defuse. The reason for this are the Potara earrings. People who fuse with the Potara earrings will be fused forever. At least that was the case until Dragon Ball Super retconned it to a 1 hour time limit. Feels odd seeing characters defuse in a Tenkaichi game. It uses the same animation as when you power down from a transformed state. I've always wondered why they included this mechanic in Tag Tenkaichi and not Tenkaichi 3. And there isn't a timer telling you how much time you got left. Most fights don't even last 5 minutes, so you'd hardly ever see your character defuse. It kinda reminds me of that Budokai 3 easter egg where Goku stares at you if you don't move for 13 minutes. It seems we have some major discoveries in relation to power sensing in the Tenkaichi games. More specifically, Tenkaichi 2. So, scouter characters are actually able to locate people faster than characters with regular key sensing abilities. Ready? I see you. Ready? 
Ready? Fight! You won't get away! But if you manage to break their scouters, they'll become much less efficient. Where are you? Here's another fun fact about scouter characters. They are actually able to locate characters hiding behind structures. Don't you dare I see you! While characters who use energy sensing cannot. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? You won't get away! And to expand even further, androids cannot be detected at all. So the actual lore reason why androids cannot be detected is because they're artificial beings. They don't possess any life energy. It's actually mentioned in the show. The sea fighters had a hard time locating the androids since they were unable to detect their energy. Huge shout out to Al Darkin and Kido for pointing these details out. In Tenkaichi 3, once you reach your last health bar, aka the red bar, your character will be in this exhausted slash injured pose. Now, most characters have a basic injured animation. They're pretty much the same with slight alterations. Then we have Vegeta. There are four versions of Vegeta in this game. Scouter Vegeta, Android Saga Vegeta, Boo Saga Vegeta, and GT Vegeta. And all four of these versions of Vegeta share the same low health animation. This one. Every single form of Vegeta has him grabbing his arm as if it were broken or badly injured. By now, you should probably recognize this as a reference to his infamous post from the show. There's a misconception that Android 18 resulted in Vegeta's arm getting broken. Oh no! But that doesn't seem to be the case. We can see Vegeta holding his left arm in his iconic pose during his fight with Raccoon, so we know it goes early as Frieza Saga. Some even say his first fight with Goku triggered this chronic injury. Even in the game, his Saiyan Saga version is featured in this pose, so it very well could be the case. I honestly love this gag. It even appears in Dragon Ball Super. Tenkaichi 3 offers a wide array of different outfits for each character, some more than others. I wanted to focus and Broly here, since they actually put a couple of easter eggs on his second outfit. On the surface, outfits 1 and 2 look basically the same, but there's more to it. His skin looks much more pale and bleak on the second outfit. That could very well be a reference to the fact that he was frozen under ice for a really long time. You can also see a bunch of scratches and bruises on his stomach area, and if you watch the first movie, you'll know why they're there. Now, once you transform into Super Saiyan, kill you. Broly's hair will turn blue, same as it did in the first movie. And if you select the second outfit, I'll kill you. Yep, it's green. And if you're wondering why it's green, in Broly's second coming, his Super Saiyan hair color was green rather than the blue color from the first movie. It's a fun nod to the original movies. And if you were to ask me why he has two different colors for the same transformation, I honestly don't know. It could have something to do with that headband thingy restricting his power. Hence, the blue color. Since his hair should be green, judging by his green aura and his DBS Broly movie appearances. There's a really strange glitch in Tenkai too. If you select Super Saiyan for Goku and Vegeta to fight each other, they'll do their little interaction. And once Goku wins, we get this. Even though my game is set to English, Goku will speak in Japanese for some reason. I went over to Tenkaichi 3 to see if such a glitch would occur. Everything works fine here. Sorry, I win this one. Probably just a glitch that happened during translation. Speaking of translation errors, in Tenkaichi 3, SSJ3 GT Goku doesn't speak. He's basically mute in this game. Now, I haven't watched GT in a long while, but I'm pretty sure he talks normally in the show. So, what's going on here? He doesn't talk during battle, doesn't make any pain noises, doesn't even shout his signature move. Is this another dubbing error? Well, Yes. As soon as I switch the language to Japanese, he talks normally. Probably one of those dubbing inconsistencies that many of these older DBZ games have. Here's my favorite one, SSJ for Goku using his kid voice. In Tenkaichi 1, there's a really subtle easter egg with Super Saiyan 4 Goku. There's something odd about his Kamehameha x 10. Take a look.
I mean, the voice sync is weird, but that's not it. Isn't Kamehameha times 10 supposed to be red? Well, no, the game actually got it right. Kamehameha times 10 is actually supposed to be blue. The Budokai games, later Tenkaichi games, Xenoverse, they all got it wrong. Right? The truth is, Tenkaichi 1's version is correct, but so are all the other versions. The original version of Kamehameha x10 was actually blue in the show. Only during the Super 17 saga was it changed to its iconic red look. But why only Tenkaichi 1? Maybe it was a little reference to the original? Either that, or they simply forgot to color it. There's a move in Tenkaichi 3 called Mystic Breath. It's not a super move like you'd expect. Rather, it's one of those utility moves which are mostly unique to each character. For example, one of Goku's utility moves is Instant Transmission. Tien has Solar Flare. Boo has, well, Sleep. Mystic Breath is mostly used by evil demon type characters like Dabora, Evil Boo, Janimba, and Oob. Oob's not evil, but he probably inherited it from Boo. The effect of Mystic Breath is quite strange. It's not a move meant to stun enemies like Frieza has. It just pushes enemies back while dealing less than a thousand damage. So it obviously isn't there to deal damage. For the longest time, I thought this was just a dumb move without any benefits. Well, believe it or not, it actually has one one of the rarest effects in the game. The second, or should I say, primary effect of Mystic Breath is the negation of super attacks. Fun fact, each character has its own version of Mystic Breath. Boo and Oob have a regular white version. Janimba has a slightly pinkish one. And Dabora spits literal fire. While playing with Oob, I noticed something interesting. Take a look at the way he throws his key blasts. Most characters throw their key blasts in a straightforward fashion, yet Oob throws them sideways. One to the left, one to the right, and they meet in the middle. I tested this with a bunch of characters, and none of them were doing it the same as Oob. Not sure if this is a reference to something. Then again, I haven't watched GT in a while, so it's possible I could have missed it. In Tenkaichi 3, there's a world tournament mode. Now, there isn't anything inherently wrong with it. In fact, I love it. I've poured countless hours into this mode, but I do have a gripe with it. There are five tournament arenas in total. We have the classic martial arts tournament stage, the Cell Games Arena. Yamcha game doesn't have a singular stage. Every battle is fought on a different stage, which is fitting. The whole gimmick of Yamcha game is based on randomness. The problem comes when we select the other world tournament. On the surface, everything looks great. You see the other world stage in the back. There's the Mushroom Man announcer. Super Saiyan 3 Goku is waiting for you at the top. So where's the issue? Well, the other world stage, it doesn't exist. It's a lie. I'm kidding, but there's no stage for it. It's not even modeled. Every battle takes place on the regular map pool, and most of them are on Earth. Come to think of it, does any DBZ game feature the other world arena? Well, maybe Boost Fury. The same goes for Mr. Satan's tournament stage. You see this spectacular night arena, but as soon as you start a battle, yep, it's the standard map pool. Arale is a really interesting character. Waka, 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 waka. She's one of those gag characters. A gag character is someone who usually doesn't abide by the rules of the universe in which they are set in. Due to this, she has some ridiculous feats, like knocking the shit out of Vegeta in Dragon Ball Super. Looks like her gag abilities carried over to Tenkaichi 3. When you attack giant characters like Great Apes, Herudgarn, and Broly, they usually don't react. They have this, I guess we can call it, armor protection, which makes them immune to attacks from most of the characters in the game. But Arale on the other hand, due to her gag character abilities, straight up breaks that armor. <laughs> I'm honestly impressed the devs took her special abilities into account here. There's a fight in the special saga of Tenkaichi 3 story mode where Goku and Vegeta fight Janimba. At the very beginning of the fight, you can notice something unique. Aside from the location of the fight, which is literally hell, you'll notice Goku and Vegeta have halos above their heads. Keep in mind, 
this will be the first and last time we see them with halos in Tenkaichi 3. There isn't a single costume or outfit which features them with halos above their heads. Maybe those halos are just exclusive to the story mode? Naturally, I was a little bit confused. So I searched online to see if I could maybe find some more info about it. Some people were saying you needed to keep dying a certain number of times in a row in order to unlock them. Others were saying they only appeared on the hell stage. But none of those things were true. At this point, I was about to give up. I thought they were exclusive to the story mode and there was no way to unlock them. Until I was scrolling through the comments on my previous video when a random comment caught my eye. Is it really that simple? So I went to the character customizations and equipped the Halo item, selected Goku, hey! and loaded into the game. I honestly didn't expect it to be this simple. I've played this game for nearly 15 years, and only now have I finally figured this out. The Halo equip item only works for Goku and Vegeta. If you equip it to any other character, it won't be visible. Also, if both Goku and Vegeta are equipped with it while performing the fusion dance, Gogeta will receive it as well. I am the one who will destroy you! If you go to Tenkaichi 3's ultimate battle mode, there's a small chance of receiving a little gift from Android 18. Later. Future Gohan is quite a rare character when it comes to appearances in games. He does pop up in, for example, Tenkaichi 3, Raging Blast 2, Xenoverse 2, and Kakarot. And out of those four games, only in Kakarot does he have his iconic one-arm look. Well, there is one more, but we'll get to it in a second. In Tenkaichi 3, while playing with Future Gohan, you'll notice how he uses only one of his arms for all of the attacks and super moves. Grab attack, only one arm. Super attack, one arm. Ultimate attack, well, you get the point. It's obvious the devs were referencing his little tragedy from the History of Trunks special, but couldn't actually remove one of his arms due to the rating of the game, which is 12 plus. Then there's a little game from 2005 called DBC Sagas, where after beating the game, you unlock a variety of different characters, one of them being future Gohan without his arm. Gohan! This is the only main DBC game to feature him with one arm up until the release of Kakarot in 2021. I decided to leave this one for last. This is something I only discovered while trying to unlock Devilman. Before you unlock Devilman's What If battle, there's another What If battle where the Saiyans actually manage to defeat Frieza but die in the process. The character we'll be focusing on here is Fasha, whom I forgot to mention in my previous video. There is also a reference to Tora. If you watched the previous video, you'll know why I'm mentioning him. Fasha is meant to die during her battle with Zarbon, and Bardock would take her place. Even though the odds are against us, there's a small chance we can actually beat Zarbon with Fasha. It does involve a lot of cheese and ultimate attack spam. If we do manage to defeat Zarbon with Fasha, we will trigger a secret cutscene. Enough, you sick freak! Fasha, get out of here! We need you to give birth to the next generation. I'm a warrior. I'm ready to die with you. <laughs> You're one stubborn woman. There's already someone to carry on. The kid you sent to that backwards planet. <laughs> yeah. Kakarot, you have to live on. This is your father's last request. Let's go, Fasha. Tora is waiting for us in the next world. Right. I'm with you. Tenkaichi 3 has a counter system that allows you to cancel your combos and hold the counter slash defense position. If you get hit while in that position, you'll launch an automatic counter attack. Most characters have this basic counter stance. For example, let's take a look at Goku's stance. It's basically a default stance, which many characters share. Certain characters such as Vegito have minor changes. Super Vegito has an even more unique one, probably a reference to his heavy use of legs for defense as well as offense. But the one I find the most interesting is Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta. Let's take a look. 
Did you catch it? You can see GT Gogeta do this little hand spin thing. It's a bit hard to see, but he's actually pointing his finger to his right shoulder. For those of you who might not get it, it's a subtle reference to his fight with Omega Shenron, in which he was being taunted by Gogeta. He's essentially telling Omega to give him a scratch because his attacks were, and I quote, tickling him. In Tenkaichi 2, while gathering energy for the spirit bomb, the energy you gathered actually appears in the sky. Now, here's a cool detail. Each time you gather energy, the spirit bomb will progressively get larger. Share your energy with me! Share your energy with me! Once enough energy is gathered, charge your key up and activate the spirit bomb. Here it comes! For some reason, Goku teleports to the sky and then throws it in Tenkaichi 2. I do like this little detail. It kind of reminds me of the instant- Kami, Kami! In one of my previous videos, I went over a little censorship detail in regards to Android 18. More about it in this video. Well, did you know that Jace had a similar issue? In Tenkaichi 2, he says this. Don't play stupid with me, wanker! While in Tenkaichi 3, Don't play stupid with me! You can hear the abrupt cutoff. It's obvious which code was supposed to go here. One censorship detail that always intrigued me was Bardock's final revenger attack. In Tenkaichi 3, he only does one knee kick to the enemy's back before finishing his combo. Yet in Tenkaichi 2... I remember reading somewhere that his Tenkaichi 2 version was deemed too violent. I mean, I can kind of see it, but it's a fighting game. I guess they had to comply with the game's rating. Destructo discs have a unique property in Tenkaichi games. You can usually block most of super attacks. However, Destructo discs just shred through the guard. Even regular Key Blast versions of them are unblockable. I guess they were referencing the anime. Only way to avoid them there was to dodge. One thing I like to do is charge and throw them. Rush at the enemy. If by some chance the enemy manages to get the upper hand, your Destructo Disc will hit them in their blind spot. Devil Man is one of the most forgotten characters in the entire DB franchise, which makes his inclusion in Tenkaichi 3 kind of shocking. For some reason, and I don't even know what that reason is, they decided to put him in a game and actually give him a lot of detail and attention. Aside from a what-if story mission, where he literally saves the Earth by defeating Frieza and his father, his Devil Might Beam has a complex system that measures the evilness of characters. For example, Goku has no evil in his heart. Every single version of him, even GT Goku. You're wide open! You're too much for me. However, when transforming into Super Saiyan, his heart gets slightly tainted with evil, probably due to rage, which is necessary to awaken Super Saiyan. 1500 is the max damage Goku can receive, be it Super Saiyan 1, 2, 3, or even 4. I guess the evilness doesn't stack with each new transformation. The one character I wasn't expecting to have evil in his heart was Kid Gohan. It looks like the little guy actually has a tiny sliver of evilness, whereas Goten has zero. You're Gummy, too Gummy. much for me. When performing Solar Flare, your opponent becomes blinded for a few seconds, just like in the anime. Solar Flare! However, characters who wear glasses or shades are immune to the blinding effect of Solar Flare. Solar Flare! What's wrong? Nothing. No reaction whatsoever. Now, Master Roshi is unique. When you hit him with your ultimate move, his outfit and body will be damaged severely. And in the process, his glasses get destroyed as well. Meaning, if we hit him with a solar flare, he should be blinded, right? Solar flare! <laughs> yep. The game will take into account that his glasses got destroyed during the battle and make him vulnerable to Solar Flare. Insane details in my opinion. There's a strange easter egg inside Kame House in Tenkaichi 3. This one is quite tricky, since you would never be able to see it without using camera hacks or glitching inside. During regular gameplay, you will break the house, meaning you won't be able to see anything. But once you actually manage to go inside, you can see a goofy picture of Master Roshi on the TV screen. <laughs> What's the significance? I honestly don't know. Maybe it's a funny little reward for the players who managed to get inside. <laughs> Broly's scream will progressively get more and more deeper with each new transformation. Kakarot! 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 
Yajirobe is the only character who can use the Senzu beans in the Tenkaichi series. Which is fitting considering he's the closest friend of Korin. Like in the anime, Senzu beans will completely restore your health. No wonder this skill is only limited to one character. It's insanely overpowered. They do drain your skill gauge. In fact, it's the hardest skill to activate, costing 5 skill points. I guess this somewhat balances it out, but for someone who knows how to control the game, they can activate it easily. Time to chow down. Wonder if Yajirobe gets play in the competitive scene. Speaking of broken techniques, Captain Ginyu. Captain Ginyu probably has one of the most unique techniques in DBC, the body swap technique. In the anime, like the name suggests, he swaps bodies. However, in DBC games such as Tenkaichi 3, there's an interesting little twist. Captain Ginyu's whole gimmick is to inflict damage to himself if he feels like he cannot win a battle. And his moveset in Tenkaichi 3 reflects that. Once your health gets low enough and you feel like you're about to lose, just activate the body swap and cheese your way to victory. Now! now here's an interesting part. You don't actually swap bodies with your opponent. I guess the devs felt that you would be a little too OP. Instead, you switch with a random character, in my case, Goku and Krillin. Your health gets restored, which is a nice plus. However, you're unable to use any moves of the swapped characters, which kind of balances it out. Kind of bummed out they didn't give him the scouter. In Tenkaichi 3, if you get hit by a powerful ultimate attack or get blinded by solar flare, you lose track of your opponent and frantically turn your head left and right in an attempt to locate him. Where'd you run off to? This applies to most characters. Characters with scouters such as Saiyans and members of the Frieza Force are the only exceptions. Instead of doing the usual, scouter characters will actually turn their scouters on and then scan the area. Don't you dare run for me! They're doing this because they're actually unable to sense energy and need scouters to assist them. We have a similar situation in Budokai 3. Budokai 3 has the Dragon Universe mode. It's essentially a campaign mode, which allows you to travel around and explore the planet. Most characters in the Dragon Universe know how to sense energy. Thanks to that, they can easily detect various activities around the planet. Then there's Vegeta. Due to not possessing key sensing abilities, he is unable to locate various activities without his counter. However, thanks to his time on Earth, as soon as you reach the Frieza Saga, Vegeta will no longer use the counter. By this point, he has already mastered energy sensing. It's already established that Gotenks is a somewhat fourth wall breaker type character in Tenkaichi 3. In one of my previous videos, we went over a little easter egg where he says Peanut Butter Jelly Time. It was basically a reference to a meme that was popular at the time BT3 was released. But what I didn't know during the time I made that video is that Gotenks would utter these words upon beating Broly. This next one is one of the things that I always appreciated about Tenkaichi 3. I feel like no one even talks about it. Now, certain characters in Tenkaichi 3 have super armor. Appreciate everyone in the comments for pointing out the correct term for this. Giant characters are usually the ones who have this super armor. There's also Broly, who seems to have super armor as well, probably due to his size. We'll also use Broly throughout this section, since he's the easiest one to work with. The point where this super armor breaks is at Super Saiyan 3. 3 level, meaning SSJ3 tier characters are able to shred through that armor with ease. What's funny is that the game doesn't consider Mystic Gohan SSJ3 tier, which is surprising considering Gohan is supposed to be stronger than SSJ3 while in his mystic form. But that's a whole different power scale discussion, which I don't want to get into. Base form Goku takes 6 hits to break the armor, Super Saiyan takes 5, Super Saiyan 2 takes 4, and SSJ3 and above instantly break it. 
Cell Saga introduced us to the concept of Super Saiyan grades. Tenkaichi 3 also decided to adapt and add them to the game. We have mastered Super Saiyan, which Goku and Gohan achieved. Grade 2 Vegeta, also known as Super Vegeta. Fun fact, here's what Chi Chi thinks of Vegeta's grade 2 form. I have no interest in the differences of a Super Saiyan, but those muscles are incredible. Now, Trunks is the only character featured in his bulky form, aka grade 3. According to Goku, this form is immensely strong, but lacks in speed. This sentiment is very much reflected in Tenkaichi 3. The form is insanely bulky and looks awesome. It's borderline Broly levels. Unfortunately, it feels way too slow and sluggish once you actually play with it. His attacks take an eternity to connect. He's barely able to throw key blasts. Overall, it's just way too sluggish to play with, which isn't a bad thing since it's accurate to its manga counterpart. Would you believe that this form is considered top tier in the competitive scene? It's not top tier due to his moveset or anything. Rather, the three key bars with which Super Trunks spawns with. Those three key bars are a big deal in this game. In order to launch super attacks, you would need three key bars. 95% of characters spawn with one or two. To find a character with three is quite rare. Essentially, competitive players select grade three Trunks, then immediately switch back to his base form. Thanks to this, they're able to use base trunks super attacks at the very beginning of the game without having to charge their key. And base form trunks is a pretty good character in his own right. Thanks to his grade 3 form, competitive players are able to make his base form, which is good on its own, even better. <laughs> Tenkaichi 3 has a mechanic where characters charge their key slower while underwater. Apparently, the reason for the slower charge is the water, which messes with key control. Androids, on the other hand, due to being machines, don't share those restraints whilst being underwater. They don't care if they're charging underwater or on land. However, there's one character who benefits from charging underwater. Cyberman is the only character in the entire game who actually charges faster while underwater. Is there any explanation for this? Well, there is no official explanation, but it might have something to do with him being a literal plant. Huge shout out to Guildmaster Andy for pointing this out. Tenkaichi 3 has a lot of characters, and I do mean a lot. Over 150 in fact. Considering Tenkaichi 3 is a fighting game, it also has to give each character a losing slash defeated animation. Now, if you ever played Tenkaichi 3, you probably noticed how 95% of the characters reuse one of these three animations. They either fall to their knees and collapse, or just face plant straight to the ground. This is in a diss towards the developers. Creating unique animations for 150 plus characters would be a nightmare. Having said all that, they did give us some unique ones. I went over all of the losing poses for each character, and here's what I found. As you'd expect, Yamcha's iconic pose is there. Cyberman's head will pop open once he hits the ground. Peel off machine who just collapses to the back. The Arale one is cute. Bye! Rikum also has his iconic pose? They also gave Rikum's pose to a couple of low-level Frieza soldiers. Bobbidi isn't all that unique, but it has a little animation for his crystal ball. Nova Shenron has a similar pose to Yamcha's for some reason. First and second form cell also have a slightly altered collapsing animation. And then there's General Blue. Oh, it feels kinda nice. I don't usually talk about character interactions, but I have to share these. Hey, Baldy, what's the meaning of the M on your forehead? Mama's boy! Wha what is this? Kind of rich coming from Vegeta. Whoa! You're one big lizard! Lizard? How dare you insult me like that? Just to give some clarification, this is the original version of Kid Goku, not to be confused with GT Goku. Did you know that Solar Flare has the ability to negate super and ultimate attacks? I'm gonna be honest, in my nearly 15 years of playing, I had no idea this was possible. You can cancel out all of rush attacks, like Kid Buu's infamous mystic combination. Solar oh. Flare! I always thought you had to get all up in your enemy's face for Solar Flare to work, but it looks like I was wrong. Due to Solar Flares working from a distance, you're actually able to cancel blast attacks, such as Vegeta's Gallic Gun for example. Solar Flare! Goku's instant Kamehameha, which is arguably one of the hardest attacks to avoid, also falls victim to Solar Flare's might. 
Almost all of ultimate attacks in BT3 are vulnerable to Solar Flare. For a simple utility move that only consumes one of your skill bars, it's a rather useful technique to have. Solar Flare! Going back to Tenkaichi 1, have you ever noticed something odd about Tien's Tri-Beam attack? Here's how it looks in Tenkaichi 2 for comparison. In Tenkaichi 1, he uses it as an actual beam attack, whereas in 2, he shoots out a square-shaped blast. You can even beam clash it with other super attacks. While in later games, it just negates other attacks and goes straight through them. Now, you could argue this was an intentional choice by the devs. Remember that scene when Tien saved Gohan from Super Buu? He did, in fact, use his Tri Beam as an actual beam attack, rather than the version we're used to seeing. So, it very well could be a reference to the show. It could also be a case of laziness on the developer's side. Tenkaichi 1 wasn't exactly the most polished game after all. Many super attacks were simple recolors, and Tri Beam could be just another one of them. But if it was intentional, then it's definitely a cool nod to a lesser known version of such an iconic move. What's the matter? I was messing around on the cell game stage in Tenkaichi 3 when he stumbled upon something interesting. I believe I saw two figures standing in the distance watching me fight. It's very faint, but someone is definitely standing there. Naturally, I went closer to investigate. Due to Tenkaichi 3's invisible world borders, this was as close as I could get. At least without using free cam mode, that is. Thanks to free cam, I was able to go out of bounds and... I thought so. It's a low-quality 2D sprite of the Cell Games announcer along with his cameraman. I don't think I ever noticed this until now. I guess most of us play this game on older TVs, with PS2's limited resolution quality making it really hard to notice stuff like this. A really cool hidden detail and a fun nod to the show. In Tenkaichi 3, there is a mechanic that allows you to launch a barrage of key blasts by pressing jump and then the key button. The type and amount of key blasts you'll throw varies from character to character. Generally, most characters will throw around 3 to 5 key blasts. And then we have Vegeta. Vegeta was always known for being a key blast spammer, especially when he feels threatened or desperate. Looks like the devs took Vegeta's spamming tendencies into account while designing this feature. Like I said, most characters fire around 3 to 5 key blasts, while Vegeta shoots 10 of them. Already. Vegeta is not the only one who does this. There is also one more character who fires 10 key blasts while jumping, and his name is. <laughs> Hello, monkeys! Frieza will also fire 10 of them, but only in his third form. Why only in his third form, you may ask? Well, similar to Vegeta, third form Frieza is also known for being a heavy spammer of his Death Beam key blasts, most notably in his fight against Piccolo on Namek. Infinite World even made a whole mini game because of it. I won't let a single one of you insects live! We're all familiar how Tenkaichi 3 features visible battle damage for characters if they take enough damage. It's usually done by getting hit with an ultimate move or by losing a beam struggle. Some characters like Goku Mid have a selectable battle damaged outfit you can select at the very beginning of a fight. And if you get hit by an ultimate while playing in that outfit, that outfit will become even more damaged, with Goku's gi getting even more torn apart. A nice little reference to his fight against Frieza. The character I wanted to focus on in this section is Bardock, who, similar to Goku, also has a battle damaged outfit you can select and play with at the very beginning of a battle. Looking from the back, both outfits look pretty much the same. And when we get a better look from the front, even then they look the same. Or do they? Let's zoom in a bit more on the left one. Do you guys see it? It's blood. 
the characters in Tenkaichi 3 actually bleed. Well, only Bardock as far as I can see. And these aren't just random traces of blood. It's a reference to how Bardock looked after his fight with Dodoria. I believe Bardock is the only character who actually has visible blood in Tenkaichi 3. I also tested this with SSJ2 Teen Gohan in his battle damaged outfit, which features him with a broken arm. Sadly, there wasn't anything interesting to see. And if you watch the anime, you'd know what his arm should look like like. So yeah, looks like Bardock is the only one, at least to my knowledge. Let's talk about one of the more underrated characters in the entirety of Dragon Ball Z. Goldo. I mean, before Hit, he was the original Time Stopper. I know most games overlook him, but that isn't the case with Tenkaichi 3 and Raging Blast. I was testing some of his interactions in both of those games when I stumbled upon an interesting find. See, Tenkaichi 3 has a sway mechanic. Depending on which directional button you press, combined with X, your character will either sway backwards or do a little dodge to the side. Now, with Galdo, it seems like the devs wanted to put a little easter egg with his sway animation. When you attempt to do a backward sway while playing with Galdo, he will do this cute little run. The same happens if we sway to the sides. He will keep avoiding attacks while in that goofy running animation. In Tenkaichi 3, if you're savvy with the game's movement mechanics, you can force him to run in this animation as long as you want. If you watch the anime, you will immediately recognize the reference. That is the same goofy run he did in his battle with Krillin and Gohan. You can even do this in Raging Blast. Although, there's a limit in that game. You won't be able to keep him running like you could in Tenkaichi 3. Tenkaichi 3 has a couple of these. Let's call them last resort techniques. A good example of this is Vegeta's final explosion. He charges up and performs a massive explosion wave. The attack does decent damage, but it leaves you with only 1 HP, a mere key blast away from death. I was never a fan of these attacks in Tenkaichi 3. That health decrease just isn't worth the amount of damage you'll deal. These last resort techniques can only be performed once. If you attempt to do them a second time, you simply won't be able to. But then, it hit me. What if I were to get my HP all the way back up? Getting HP back all the way can be a bit tricky. Luckily, Second Form Cell has the ability to regenerate his health and also has a self-destruct move. So. I got started. I performed Cell's desperate self-destruct explosion, which, as you'd expect, left me at 1 HP. I then went through the tedious process of regenerating health by draining the life force off of enemies. After a good few minutes, my health was restored. All that's left is to perform Cell's self-destruction attack. Yeah. This isn't working. Seems like the devs really wanted to be faithful to the source material. Although, Tien's new tri-beam doesn't seem to share these restrictions. Even though it's one of these last resort techniques, you'll still be able to use it more than once, no matter how much HP you have left, even if you're on 1 HP. <laughs> In Budokai Tenkaichi 1, we have the island stage. This stage is supposed to be a recreation of the islands where the whole fight against Cell and the androids took place. Before arriving on these islands, the androids land at Kame House, at which point they get confronted by Piccolo. He convinces them to move their battle to a nearby island, so the rest of the Z fighters don't have to get involved. And also, so they don't completely annihilate Kame House. The androids then follow Piccolo and finally arrive at the islands. The reason I gave you this quick summary of the events is because I wanted to show you just how much care and attention to detail were put into this stage. If we rotate our cameras a tiny bit, we will be able to see a familiar pink house in the distance. It's not close, it's not really far away, it's just there, nearby, just as it was in the show. I know it's a simple detail, but I love it. It makes all of these battle stages feel connected. The weird thing is, in the very next game, Kame House is nowhere to be seen. It's gone, completely removed. I mean, sure, we can still fight at the Kame House stage, but that little easter egg from the first Tenkaichi game is gone.
So, some of you have pointed out that Buhan shows visible human skin once battle damaged, which does sound kind of disturbing. I played this game for a good while, and I don't think I've ever seen something like that. Nevertheless, I decided to take a closer look. I busted up Super Boo, and... I can definitely see something. Although, I don't believe it's human skin. I think it's just Gohan's gi torn apart. It kind of resembles human skin, if you're looking from afar. Buhan has never shown human skin underneath all his... pink? Which leads me to believe that this is nothing more than people confusing Gohan's torn gi with human skin. The PS2 era textures certainly don't help. That's my theory at least. General Blue has some strange interactions in Tenkaichi 3. First off, it seems like he isn't very fond of women. D don't come any closer, girl! Disgusting! What? What is he? One character he appears to be fond of is Trunks. I'm back from the underworld! <laughs> you can't escape. Why do I have to deal with this? <laughs> now you're mine. <laughs> But that's not the strange part. His fondness of Trunks goes even further. Things get a bit disturbing if we face off against Kid Trunks while playing with General Blue. Oh, how cute! Does the little boy want to fight? Whoa, it suddenly got colder! <laughs> <laughs> now you're mine. <laughs> How cute! There are four different versions of Goku in Tenkaichi 3. Well, technically five. But we're not counting Kid Goku for this one. Early Goku, Goku Mid, Buu Saga Goku, and GT Goku. And each of the Gokus have a unique version of the spirit bomb tied to them. Early Goku, aka Saiyan Saga Goku, forms the energy in his hand and launches it at the enemy. This was the first and most primitive version of the spirit bomb. So, naturally, it's the weakest. And the game very much reflects that, with it dealing a maximum damage of 14,010 damage. Frieza Saga Goku deals a total of 16,040 damage. Granted, this version of the spirit bomb can reach up to 40,000 if you use to share your energy skill enough times. However, without using any skill hacks, this version will deal 16,040 max. The Super Spirit Bomb was the biggest one by that point in the series. Goku performed it in his battle against Kid Buu. It was the biggest and strongest one up to that point. And the same goes for Tenkaichi 3. The maximum damage the Super Spirit Bomb can output is 16,320. It's not that much stronger than the one used against Frieza, but it still keeps the power progression thing going. My guess is that they didn't want to make it too powerful in order to keep the game somewhat balanced. I always thought this was a neat little detail. However, I do have issues with GT Goku. See, GT Goku uses the so-called Universal Spirit Bomb. While it's the biggest and strongest version of the Spirit Bomb in the anime, it's the smallest in the game. I also believe Goku mispronounces it as Spirit Ball instead of Spirit Spirit Bomb. It does 16,040 of damage, same as the one used on Nemec. Kind of wish they continued with that power progression thing they had going on. It is the strongest version of the Spirit Bomb after all. My guess is that they didn't want to break the balance, or they simply forgot about it. In order to explain the significance of this next one, I'll have to give you a quick rundown. In BT3, certain characters have super armor. This is mostly reserved for giant type characters such as Great Apes and, well, Broly. This super armor can be broken if you're using a Super Saiyan 3 tier character, meaning characters such as Super Saiyan 2 Goku, Perfect Cell, SSJ2 Gohan, and so on can't break that armor without launching a few consecutive punches. Whereas characters above Super Saiyan 3 tier of power can break the armor instantly. <laughs> Now that we have that covered, let's move on to the main thing. SSJ3 tier characters might be able to break their super armor with a single punch. But their key blasts, on the other hand... <laughs> Nothing. No reaction whatsoever. I even tried Super Saiyan 4 Gogeta, who's arguably the strongest character in the game. Again. 
nothing. While it doesn't make sense power scaling wise, in terms of how this game functions, it makes perfect sense. In order to balance the speed drawbacks that come with being a giant, they were given key blast immunity, meaning giant characters will not react to key blasts thrown by regular, normal sized fighters. They will only react to key blasts fired by other giant type characters. And also, let's not forget, you can never surpass me. Broly's a literal beast in this game. Being an affected by Key Blast Stagger is kind of a big deal here. He's basically got all the perks of being a giant type character without any of the drawbacks that come with it. No wonder he stands in the league of his own in a competitive scene. In both Tenkaichi 1 and 2, Master Roshi is addressed as Turtle Hermit by the tournament announcer. Alright then, this is the start of the first round. Contestant Turtle Hermit versus Contestant Cell? Even Cell refers to him as Turtle Hermit. First round is beginning. Turtle Hermit versus... Turtle Hermit being his title. Fun fact, Kame means turtle in Japanese. While it's not necessarily wrong to refer him as Turtle Hermit, I just find it a bit odd. I know Tenkaichi 3 included an easter egg with Piccolo and Supreme Kai being named Ma Junior and Shin. Both are references to their world tournament aliases. But Turtle Hermit is not Master Roshi's tournament alias. His alias should be Jackie Chun, not Turtle Hermit. This was either a clever reference to his less used alias or an oversight by the localization team. My guess is that this was an intentional detail due to both Cell and the tournament announcer referring to him as such. I saw one comment from Mr. Jagger1407 that piqued my interest. He's a fellow Tenkaichi YouTuber who makes content on Tenkaichi 2's combat and mechanics. He mentioned Kid Gohan's skill, Hidden Energy, and was baffled how it doesn't do anything besides take away all your key. Naturally, I got curious. Surely there has to be some sort of upside to this skill. I booted up Tenkaichi 2, picked Kid Gohan, and activated the Hidden Energy skill. Strange. Nothing happened. Just like Jagger1407 said, all it did was drain away all of my key. I tried using it a couple of more times, but to no avail. Other than losing all of my key, nothing else was happening. At this point, I gave up and went on to test something else. About an hour later, I was playing with Yajirobe in Android 13. I was messing around with Yajirobe's skills only to find out that he also has hidden energy. I figured, what the heck, let's try it. At first, it seemed like nothing had happened. But when I got closer to Android 13, a lock-on? It was at this moment that everything became clear to me. What the skill does and why these two characters have it. Both Gohan and Yajirobe were specialists in hiding their energy. Yajirobe's most notable use of this would be his sneak attack on Grape Ape Vegeta. As for Gohan, much of his adventures on Namek consisted of him and Krillin hiding their energy against Vegeta and Frieza's forces. Hence, I believe that this is just a genius reference to their signature use of key manipulation. Manipulation. From what I've seen, only these two have it. I guess they could have also given it to Krillin, but he has his signature solar flare skill, so there isn't much space left for hidden energy. Also, one thing to note, hidden energy only works if you're hiding behind structures. If the enemy has you in his sights, it won't do anything. I just figured out the best way to showcase the effect of hidden energy is through the split screen mode. Teen Gohan's second outfit has a subtle easter egg in Tenkaichi 3. I'm going to pull both outfits 1 and 2 up on the screen. Let's see if you can spot the difference. And no, I'm not talking about his orange gi. Did you notice anything else that looks off on the second outfit? Take a closer look at his hair. It's very subtle, but they changed his hair to match his Bojack movie appearance. They could have easily reused his Cell Saga hairstyle for this outfit and no one would notice. But they decided to to go out of their way to make it accurate to his movie hairstyle. A simple little detail that's fairly easy to miss. Tenkaichi 3 has a couple of chargeable super attacks. You got Gallic Gun, Kamehameha, Special Beam Cannon, Masenko, etc. Like the name implies, you're able to charge them, and the longer you charge them, the more damage they will deal. 
Or will they? You'd think that it would work like that, but no. Tenkaichi 3 likes to do things a bit differently. First, I'm going to launch a Kamehameha with zero charge time. Now, I'm going to charge it all the way up. And finally, I'm going to release it slightly before it reaches the maximum charge time. Well, isn't that odd? It did more damage than the one that's fully charged. What exactly happened here? It appears that Tenkaichi 3 has a hidden mechanic. And as someone who has played this game since its initial release, I only found out about it a few days ago. Here's how it works. While charging your Kamehameha, less than a second before reaching its climax, you'll hear a distinct audio cue, signaling the perfect moment to release your attack. If timed correctly, your chargeable super attack will do more damage than a fully charged version of said attack. I've always heard the audio cue, but thought little of it, other than a simple sound effect added for some dramatic effect. I'm honestly surprised that it took me this long to figure it out. How about you guys? Did you just learn about it or did you know about it before? I was doing some comparisons between Tenkaichi 2 and 3, and while playing with Supreme Kai, I stumbled upon an interesting find. For the most part, both versions of the character play the same. BT3 did give him a unique rush attack, whereas the BT2 version of him had a simple stock rush attack shared by many of the in-game characters. For a character that barely fights in the show, they did pretty alright with his moveset. But here's the best part. The Tenkaichi games have these chargeable power attacks. You basically move your analog stick in any direction you want and hold the punch button. If done correctly, your opponent will be sent flying in the corresponding direction. In layman's term, if you point your analog stick up while holding square, your opponent will get kicked into the air. You point the analog down while holding square and he will get slammed to the ground. With Supreme Kai, they were probably scratching their heads trying to come up with some unique moves for his moveset. And that's when they came up with the most clever little easter egg. His down square combo consists of him pulling out a block of Kachin and slamming the enemy into the ground. A reference to his training with Gohan in the Kai world. I'm surprised they haven't made this a super attack. You know how some characters pull that giant rock and throw it at the opponent? They could have simply replaced the rock with a Kachin block and it would have worked as a super. Still, I'm glad it got referenced. This next one has been haunting me for a good while now. I vaguely understand what they were trying to convey with this detail, but I still can't put all the puzzle pieces together. Let me explain. Tenkaichi 3 has a certain power threshold, and if that threshold were to be surpassed, a select few characters would gain a special ability. That special ability being instantaneous slash rapid movement while in max power. To perform it, you just have to press the guard button and point the analog stick in any direction you wish to teleport. Also, don't forget that you have to be powered up to the max. You had it. It's actually pretty OP, considering you can do a ton of these with just the press of a single button. You can use it to gain distance, avoid enemy attacks, sneak up on your enemy, etc. It's pretty versatile. However, things do get a little weird once we look at all the characters who can use this movement. If you recall a couple of seconds earlier, I've mentioned that characters would have to satisfy one more criteria in order to enter the rapid movement mode aside from being max powered. They would also have to surpass a certain power threshold. The threshold being Super Saiyan 3 level of power or higher. In other words, if your character is considered stronger than, let's say, SSJ3 Goku, then they would be able to perform rapid movement. If they're weaker than SSJ3, like SSJ2 Vegeta for example, then they won't be able to do rapid movement and would do a key reflect animation instead. <gasps> I really wanted to get to the bottom of this, so I tested every single character in the game and made a list of all the characters who could use rapid movement, with the hope of finally understanding how this mechanic works and why these characters can use it while all the others can't. In the top row, you have all the characters who are considered SSJ3 tier of power and above. There's Kid Buu, whose position is justified, Omega Shenron, Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta, and 
Perfect Cell? That's right. Perfect Cell can also use rapid movement. Why, you may ask? Well, while he's nowhere near close to Super Saiyan 3 level of power, he does, however, have something else going for him. He can use instant transmission. You may have noticed some characters in this row who aren't nearly as strong as SSJ3, but are still placed here. Well, it's because they fulfill a different criteria, i.e. being able to use instant transmission. Characters such as Metacooler, Supreme Kai, Perfect Cell are all able to use rapid movement due to possessing instant transmission. There's also Birder, who can do rapid movement as well, probably due to the whole fastest in the universe thing. All of these guys so far have a reason to be on this list. In the row below, we can find all the other characters who can perform rapid movement without satisfying any of the above mentioned criteria. None of them have Super Saiyan 3 level of power, nor are they able to use instant transmission. I tried making sense of it, but no luck. I mean, there's Mecha Frieza, a character who isn't even SSJ1 level of power, yet he's able to teleport like a madman. And what's more, his normal form, the non-robotic one, isn't able to do rapid movement. It's almost like those scientists gave him an upgrade when they were reassembling him. As for all the rest, I got nothing. I tried my best to break this mechanic down, but there are a few inconsistencies that kind of mess with my theory. My theory being, only characters who are considered Super Saiyan 3 tier or above and or possess the instant transmission technique are able to perform rapid movement. But a certain space tyrant and a few others kind of ruin it. So yeah, if any of you were able to shed some light on this in the comments, I'm all ears. In Tenkaichi 3, certain ultimate attacks are able to literally vaporize your opponent. This is mostly reserved for attacks that actually annihilated someone in the show, like Trunks Heat Dome attack, which he used to completely disintegrate Cell. And the same happened if we use it in a game. While the ultimate didn't necessarily need to disintegrate someone in the show in order to do the same in the game. For example, you got Goku Saiyan Saga Spirit Bomb, which didn't really do all that much to Vegeta, yet vaporizes your opponent in game. It does appear to be mostly reserved for attacks that actually disintegrated someone in the show. Also, a thing to note, disintegration is exclusive to ultimate attacks. You won't see your super attacks having the same effect. Or will you? Well, for the most part, you won't. Super attacks just don't have that kind of power. But what if you aren't using power? What if you're using... Magic. A couple of Majin Buu forms have Chocolate Beam as one of their super attacks. Let's see what happens if we turn someone into chocolate while they're on low HP. Well, would you look at that? There's nothing left. As far as I know, this is the only non-ultimate attack that's actually able to vaporize the opponent. I guess vaporize isn't the appropriate word here. Think it's more of a, oh Majin Buu ate you, and that's why there's nothing left. At least I think that was the desired intention here. In the previous video, we established that Giant-type characters have super armor. Long story short, super armor equals no reaction when getting punched. But they will, however, react to punches thrown by characters who scale to Super Saiyan 3 and above. Now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about the most unique Giant-type character. The Pilaf Machine See, when you're punching any Giant-type character, they simply won't react to your attacks, unless your character is SSJ3 level. This is a rule every Giant-type character character lives by. Well, everyone except these guys. The Pilaf Machine Fusion is the only giant type character who doesn't have super armor. They react to every single punch and kick you throw at them. Even Nam's attacks stun them. <laughs> Only character that isn't able to stun the pill of fusion is Mr. Satan, because he's… he's the champ. Also, every other giant character has zero reaction to pill of's attacks, because these guys are just that weak. But that's a good thing. The game took the whole power level dynamic into account when designing the pill of gang. It might not be fair to all you pill of fans out there, all three of you, but it's completely faithful to the source material. As we already know, Tenkaichi 3 features destructible stages. and. When I say destructible, I mean destructible. Not in the sense that you can destroy various structures
structures and objects around the map, more in the sense that you can blow up entire stages and create desolate wastelands. Now, this isn't groundbreaking or anything. We already saw the Budokai games implemented the exact same thing, and they came out before the Tenkaichi series. No, that's not why I'm mentioning this feature. Rather, I'm mentioning it because of a certain stage that can't be destroyed, no matter how much you try. Tenkaichi 3's map pool can be separated into two categories. The Earth stage pool and the space stage pool. The space map pool features a bunch of prominent locations from the series. Supreme Kai's world, planet Nemec, the unnamed planet that is supposed to be a recreation of the planet where the first Broly movie took place, and a few others. And out of all the space stages, planet Nemec is the only stage that can actually get blown up, most likely due to the fact that we've seen it happen in the show. As for all the other stages, nothing. No matter how many ultimate attacks you throw, I think it's probably because there weren't any reference points for the devs to go off of. And it would also be a real pain to design a unique destroyed version for each of the stages. And I know how much they hate doing that. Why do I say this? Well, 33 out of the 36 stages that are located on Earth use the same stage as their destroyed slash ruined version, i.e. the Wasteland stage. So what about those three other stages? Do they have a unique destroyed version or did they reuse the Wasteland stage? Well, they don't have a unique version, nor do they reuse the Wasteland stage. They simply can't be destroyed. The World Tournament stage can't be destroyed, most likely due to the fact that it's a special stage, i.e. it has special conditions, the ring out. I think developing a desolate version of it would take more time and resources, considering it functions differently from the other stages, so they just opted not to do it. Next one is Kami's Lookout. Now this one is either insanely clever or completely lazy, depending on how you look at it. This is the only Earth stage that takes place in the sky, meaning if it costs damage to the stage, you won't necessarily be causing damage to the planet itself. Therefore, there's no need to make a destroyed version. That's my theory at least. And finally, the Penguin Village. This stage is also indestructible, but I think there's a good reason behind it. The most notable resident of Penguin Village is a Raleigh, a gag character. A gag character is someone who doesn't really abide by the same rules everyone else does. We talked more about it here in a video way back. I wouldn't chalk this one up to laziness, as I believe they were going for the whole, oh, it's a gag location, a small cartoon village. It wouldn't make sense for it to be destructible, but that's just what I think. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say.